It's what Mauritanians fear the most. In just a few hours, it can plunge the country into chaos. The Hamatan is a desert wind made up of sand. On this particular occasion, it will not end in a storm, but its strength will certainly cause destruction. Propelled by the wind, 15-metre-high sand dunes have swallowed the road across hundreds of metres. While some drivers will make it through, others will fall into its merciless trap. The only way to free a vehicle from this trap is to deflate its tires. The driver decides to park his car at the side of the road while he waits for it to clear. The road will not be cleared until tomorrow morning. Mauritania is an arid country, home to the Sahara and the Sahel. Getting supplies to forgotten villages far from these oceans of sand is no easy task. The traditional camel caravans, overly demanding of human and animal power, have been replaced by age-old machines. On board, men work to the bone to ensure others don't go hungry. Every week, fished goods are transported around the country in truly unsanitary conditions. Occasionally, they travel several days in boxes in bush taxis. No ice to preserve the fish inside. Except sometimes fate has other plans. The poorest in Mauritania travel on one of the longest trains in the world. Two days of hellish travel on rickety carriages filled with iron ore. The Mauritanians have a saying, the world's beauty is made from its misery. The Sahara's splendor will never bring wealth to the people of this desert. But in this immense region, one thing that does ring out is the bravery of its inhabitants. gates of the desert lies the large town of Tijitschka. Not long ago, it was a bustling layover hub for dromedary camel caravans, but over the years, the animal lost in its battle against the machine. Dromedaries have become increasingly rare. Food and other commodities now travel on the backs of its four-wheeled cousin. <laughs> In fairness to Sid Ahmed, the driver of this vehicle, he would need 74 camels to transport the 22 tonnes piled on the back of his truck. <laughs> 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 
Sid Ahmed only ever embarks on his adventures through the desert if he has his co-pilot, Mohammed, by his side. Only a truck like Sid Ahmed's would dare traversing this terrain. The two are supplying goods to the town of Tichit, 250 kilometers of dunes and sand in the stifling heat of a sunlit truck. In order to last the three-day journey, Sid Ahmed and his co-pilot sip on a formidable energy-boosting beverage, mint tea. <laughs> The trick is to fill it to the brim and use lots of sugar. He pours the tea from one glass to the other at least 20 times. The Tagant Desert is a hell zone for both man and machine. With 40 degree heat in the shade, these old vehicles can run out of steam. At times, the rocky parts can lead to punctured tyres. At others, the truck gets covered in sand. Indeed, there are certain precautions to take. Once deflated, the tyres no longer sink in the sand. That being said, the truck can now only reach 10 kilometres an hour, but given its age, perhaps that's not a bad thing. The reason for the nickname Peasant Truck is because of its simple mechanic structure, easy to repair. The key to driving in the desert is going slow. Seven hours of driving later, the two men hit their 70th kilometer and their first delivery point. This desert farmer has been awaiting his delivery for over a month. <laughs>
الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين by way of thanks, Sharif dedicates his evening prayer to them. Only time will tell whether or not their prayer has been heard. If only to gain some time, Sid Ahmed and his co-pilot continue their journey. At night in the desert, temperatures drop to 5 degrees Celsius, a welcome relief from the furnace of the day. Suddenly, the engine loses power and an orange flashing light on their dashboard can't be good news. Both draw on their expertise to detect the leak, but after an hour of searching, it is Mohammed who finds it in the end. The truck does not belong to them. They are both employees. They earn 150 euros for each one-way trip. Though it isn't much, they believe it's better than nothing. One hundred and eighty kilometers to their destination of Tichit, an eternity in desert language. Supplying the most remote towns is a constant source of worry for the Mauritanian state, especially as most of the goods are perishable. In the capital city of Nouakchott, the port is constantly at work. At the end of the afternoon, a well-practiced routine begins. Once the boats have moored, the men stabilize them to the best of their ability. Then hundreds of hands storm the boats. Paid by the number of transported fish-filled crates, the men strive to make as many trips as possible. But this comes with its dangers. Last year, 18 men were crushed under these boats. The men transport the crates 100 metres up the beach, where ancient 404 pickup trucks from the French colonial era are loaded up. These handle the final 300 metre stretch of heavy lifting to the transport trucks. The 
These old French relics only ever ride on the beach, and it's a good job too. They're not in the best of conditions, but their engines are always ready to roar. A minor miracle, considering how they're maintained. <laughs> Once poured into the heater, they say, the tea expands and plugs the leak. There is a genius amidst these mechanics. Not all these fish are destined for consumption. Each year, more than 500,000 tonnes are fished in order to be ground into flour, flour which, ironically, will go to fish farms or to Europe and Asia to pig farms. The sea remains one of the world's largest resources, but sending fish to the other end of the desert without raising the price is tricky. So the Mauritanian state has put in place a very particular delivery method. Each week in Tijitschka, a taxi driver is responsible for transport. Today, he will be transporting 100 kilograms of mackerel. Without government support, the price of the fish would be five times higher. Mesoud faces a 300 kilometer journey to the village of Dagrigit. The passengers, just like the fish, are at risk of overheating. Mesoud has no icebox and certainly no air conditioning. Outside, the temperature is 40 degrees, and in the passenger cabin, even with the windows open, the heat is staggering. The taxi driver hopes to deliver his merchandise by evening at the very latest. In an ideal world, that is. The passengers know better than to be optimistic about arriving on time. And just a few hours in... This is not Mesoud's first flat tyre, but he struggles nonetheless.
Over in the trunk, the mackerel seems to be holding up, but will they last the night? Mesoud and his two passengers must spend the night in the desert. Over the years, the state has improved the road networks between the largest cities. But despite talk of tarmac, the terrain manages to make each journey a long and expensive ordeal. To reach the most remote villages can cost up to 30% of an annual salary, which in Mauritania is around 84 euros. The majority of the country's inhabitants are pastoralists and farmers. To get around, the poorest travellers have only one option, but it is a dangerous one. The most daring head to the iron mine. These trains are two kilometres long and are the longest in the world. They transport iron ore. Travellers are permitted to get on the first wagons of the morning train, a concession which allows the state to keep ownership of territory at low costs. But the journey is far from a smooth ride, even for this steel giant and its drivers. Crossing the desert requires specialist equipment. Indeed, once moving with its 181 wagons, it takes two kilometers to stop completely. The train and its makeshift passengers set off for a journey of over 700 kilometers. Destination, Noadibou, the industrial port. They're due to arrive in a mere 18 hours, that is, as long as all goes smoothly. Along the way, they come across nomads who have set up their tents. The drivers indulge in a tradition whose origins no one knows. Each day, the drivers distribute around 20 baguettes. Legend has it that Mauritanian nomads discovered French bread thanks to these trains. Seen in this light, breezing through the desert doesn't seem too bad after all for these drivers. Though this doesn't affect the train, for nomads this is extremely costly. One camel can cost anywhere between 150 and 1,000 euros, so in the event of accidents, the mines must compensate. This accident just happened. The train touched the chameau. It has completely cracked its pied. It happens often. De temps en temps, oui. Passengers like Mamin sit on the wagons, enduring a hellish journey with no shade for protection. Il y a tout, il y a du vent, il y a le sable, il y a la poussière, 
Il y a le froid, il y a la chaleur, il y a tout, il y a, tout, il y a presque tout. Not to mention the risks every time you have to move. Mamin is a transporter. With the support of these men, he transports goods on behalf of a trader. Flour, oil, pasta, semolina, canned goods. In total, one ton of merchandise. This exhausting and dangerous work earns him 15 euros with each one-way trip. For him, it is torture. But at 56 years old, Mamin has no other choice. Last year, his grocery store went bankrupt. The temperature can drop from 40 to 5 degrees, not counting the wind. At the halfway point, it's time to switch train conductors. It's at this moment that Mamin and his men must be on their guard. But on this day, disaster is averted. At around 5.30 a.m., an alarm triggers the automatic emergency brakes. In order to identify the problem, the drivers must manually release the brakes on each of the 181 wagons. One hour later, the mechanic realizes why the emergency brake was triggered. Around 50 of the wagons were loose. The 15,000 tons of goods exert a tremendous amount of pressure on the connecting joints. Three hours lost. 
Just my poor Travaco. It looks like it's going to be a long day for Mamin and his men. Nuadibu port is still another 135 kilometers away. Voilà, continue comme ça pour accrocher. Continue comme ça pour accrocher. Leaving opportunity for more obstacles to disrupt the smooth running of the convoy. The Mauritanian giant recently got relegated to second place among the world's largest trains. But it holds another significant title as the world's slowest train, averaging a speed of 40 kilometers per hour. Its four-wheeled competitors are no faster. Sid Ahmed and his co-pilot took three days and three nights to cover a mere 210 kilometers. With 40 to go before they reach the town of Tichit, but the toughest part of the journey still awaits them. But with 22 tons on its back, the German truck begins to sink into the sand, little by little. The sand causes Sid Ahmed's speed to drop to five kilometers per hour. After all their efforts in 45 degree heat, the white hot engine is at melting point. The two men are also overheated. Fortunately, thanks to their makeshift cooler, their desert fridge, the water is still ice cold. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> At this rate, it's unlikely the men will complete the remaining 40 kilometers by the end of the day. Fortunately for them, none of the goods they're transporting are perishable. Unlike the driver of this bush taxi. Miss Ode transports 100 kilograms of fish without anything to preserve it. 
He had to halt the journey for an entire night because of a puncture, so this morning he's keeping his foot on the accelerator. Fresh fish comes before the comfort of his passengers. Thirty-six hours and three hundred kilometers of desert terrain later, Mesaud finally delivers the fish to the inhabitants of Agrajit. Well, the mackerel isn't exactly cold. Like the majority of desert villages, Agrajid has no electricity. To keep the food fresh for a few days, the village pulled together to buy a battery-run refrigerator. Only there's one problem. Within one hour, the families have gathered together. With global warming, villages like Agrajit are doomed to disappear. The Sahara is getting hotter and hotter, while water is becoming increasingly scarce. Entire populations fleeing the desert. Just five years ago, 2,000 people lived in Inal. Today, the Sahara is slowly swallowing up homes. Masoud and the four remaining families in the village refuse to give up the land of their ancestors. But how long will they hold on? <laughs> The state provides them with water. Every Saturday, the villagers lay out this large plastic container. Then they wait for hours, sometimes the whole day, for the horn to sound. The sound of the desert's largest moving water cistern. The 480,000 litres of water contained in these cisterns determine the survival of at least 20 villages. Mm -hmm. 
This DIY hose leaks as much water as it transports to the giant flask. Within half an hour, three containers have been filled with 20 tonnes of water in each. A speedy operation, as there is no time to waste. The trains share one train track, making it impossible to cross or overtake. By the time the moving cistern sets off, the iron ore convoy has caught up and is just a few kilometres behind. Mamin has been travelling on the back of this wagon for 17 hours now and he is exhausted. He has more soot on his face than in his lungs. Last year, Mamin's grocery store went bankrupt and since then has had to accept any work he can find. Just like the transporter, he has four men who help him transport one tonne of merchandise on behalf of a trader. The iron ore train is a real lifeline. It is the means by which many do business, see their family and find work. During a stopover, a new passenger comes aboard. To avoid having to carry too much food, its owner feeds it with a peculiar mixture. The donkey represents Mustafa's last savings and a chance to find work. He usually works as a sailor, but no crew would hire him this year. Thanks to the mining train, Mustafa can save on transport, but though the iron train is free, trials are thrown in too. Thirty kilometres from the finish line, the convoy once again grinds to a halt. The engine in this lead locomotive has given up. The delay is not a loss for all, however. Out of nowhere emerge two street vendors, hoping to make a buck from the breakdown. The street vendor needn't worry. The train will not leave for another three hours. This giant of the desert finishes its crazy journey 21 hours after departure. Before entering the port of Nuajibu, the rail workers allow time for the passengers to disembark, and it's a good job too. If the animal gets injured, Mustafa can bid adieu to his new work prospects. Sure. Sure. 
شور بشور تو ولا نحضر شور يلا ها شو خاصك قاعد ما خسرتيش In a short while, Mustafa will be able to send money home to his wife and children. Mamun, on the other hand, is furious. The truck and its goods have arrived behind schedule. Mamin takes this journey 20 days each month. He doesn't know how much longer he will be able to continue. He dreams of a truck and drivers like these on a tarmac road. After four days of hard work and 250 kilometers of sand, driving at the speed of a dromedary camel, Sid Ahmed makes out the outlines of the Millennium City. Listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, Tichid has long been one of the main stops for camel caravans. They've helped make the city's fortune attracting educated scholars. A witness of the city's glorious past, the library holds manuscripts dating back to the 11th century. Though the city may have kept its splendor, its economy collapsed with the disappearance of the large merchant caravans. Getting to Tichid is always a feat for drivers. The driver rushes everyone. He's to get back on the road in a few short hours with a new load. The 3,000 inhabitants of Tichit live mainly off the harvest of a strange material. During the rainy season, the water retained in this immense basin produces salt, which mixes with the clay it is called amarsal, or earth salt. It's not for cooking with, but the Mauritanians give it to their camels, who love it for good reason. The salt traps water in the body. A few months ago, Aisha's husband left her alone to raise their children. Once 20 tons of Amasal is loaded, it's time for Sid Ahmed to hit the road. Barely any time to rest.
Mauritania has lived these past 15 years under the threat of a terrorist attack. Certain regions are still to be avoided, but the country is gradually opening back up. The Mauritanian state overcame one war, but now it faces another, that of global warming. Droughts are becoming increasingly severe. Sand is advancing even further, engulfing roads and villages. If global temperatures continue to rise, the desert will soon be empty of its inhabitants. <laughs>